Paragraph 35, required basically of any document. This is a legal and binding document and both buyers and sellers acknowledge that they have been advised to, to consult an attorney to protect their interests in this transaction. Where the transaction involves financial or tax consequences, the parties acknowledge that they have been advised to seek the advice of their accountant or financial advisor. One of the things that I think we need to make sure that we all learn, I am not an attorney. I cannot provide you with legal advice. I can simply guide you as to how you may want to fill in the blanks on this preset purchase agreement. If somebody says, well, gee, should I recommend? Well, purchase agreement says that we are recommending. Now, up to you is whether or not you need to decide whether or not anybody needs to help you take a look at this preset document that real estate agents use throughout Southeast Michigan and in Michigan, period. Because compare, there's not a whole lot of differences, guys, in regards to the purchase agreements. It's just a fine-tuning. This is that disclosure. Paragraph 36. Brokers and agents specifically disclaim responsibility for the condition of the property and or performance of the agreement by the parties. Parties acknowledge that they are not relying on or any representation or warranties that have been made other than those in writing and the parties waive and release release and relinquish any and all claims or causes of action against the brokers, their officers, directors, employees, or their agents for the condition of the property or the performance of this agreement by the parties. Brokers and its agents are not experts in the areas of law, tax, financing, surveys, structural conditions, hazardous conditions, or engineering, and buyer acknowledge that the buyer has been advised to seek professional advice from experts in these areas. Sounds like due diligence. We are real estate professionals. We are professionals in being able to market property and being able to assist buyers and sellers in coming into an agreement that will eventually close the transaction. Don't rely on us for all other things. Paragraph 37 is a simple one. The final walkthrough. Buyer reserves the right to walk through the property within 48 hours to closing to determine whether or not the property is still in the same condition that the terms of the agreement have been met. I don't think that one needs any additional entire agreement. So here's what we all know about real estate contracts. That this agreement supersedes any and all understandings and agreements and constitutes the entire agreement between the parties. There are no oral representations or statements that shall be contained or considered a part hereof. We know if it's a real estate transaction. It must be agreed to in writing. There is no other way around it. That's the way that it must be done. This is simply saying and reminding them that unless if it's on this agreement or a part of by addendum, it doesn't count. Reminder that time is of the essence. It's great for us to be reminded but we can't just take this, but here's what it says. Buyer and sellers understand that no extensions of time limits contained herein are expected, nor are they agreed unless specified in writing and signed by both the buyer and the sellers. Time is of the essence. So don't take it for granted that something is going to be extended. Get it in writing, signed by both parties. Successors and assigns typical for any contract. The agreement shall bind the personal representatives, administrators, successors, and assigns of the parties. I'm sitting back and going, do I bring it up? But yeah, basically I think it's this. Just because someone were to die doesn't preclude or doesn't exclude. It doesn't kill the, trans the agreement, I guess is the way it, I'd put it. The parties still must, whoever receives the interest, they have to move forward with it. Page 41, 
or excuse me, paragraph 41 is simply this. As an alternative to physical delivery, the parties agreed that this agreement and any amendment or modification of the agreement, any writing or communication in connection with the agreement may be delivered to the sellers in care of the listing agent and the buyers in care of the selling agent via electronic mail or facsimile via the contact information set forth above. It's a simple part of saying that digital signatures, digital delivery for notifications and so on may be done electronically, digitally. All right? Arbitration. So this is an interesting one. Any dispute over the disposition of earnest money deposits or claims arising out of or related to the physical condition of the property covered by this agreement included without limitation claims of fraud, misrepresentation, warranty, and negligence shall be set in accordance with the rules then in effect adopted by the endorsed provider of arbitration service. Well, guys, let me simplify this. You can, if any problems arise, hopefully solve them between two parties. As real estate agents, we will sometimes get involved to try to see if we can bring those two together to avoid the court systems. Arbitration would be the next simple step to avoid the courts. So do we have them sign? Well, we can't make them sign anything. What would our recommendation be? Well, I don't know that we want to recommend anything. But I had a mentor in my career, and I went to him, and I said, Tom, help me out. What, what or how should we be looking at arbitration? And he said, the best way for me to answer your question is by asking you a question. He said to me, or asked me, why would you waive your right to a juried trial? That was an interesting question. That might be the best way for you to help anyone understand, should I or shouldn't I? There are advantages, obviously, to arbitration. But would I tell anybody that they should waive their right to a jury trial? Why would you? Just ask them that question. Paragraph 43 is kind of a catch-all. The aspect of amendments, that's the only way that it will be altered, amended, or modified. Headings, only for reference purposes. Shouldn't change the meaning or interpretation of anything. Grammar or syntax, doesn't need to be construed differently, can't be misconstrued, it's the whole thing. We're even covering all of the uh, woke possibilities of the way that the world is working today. By if we said he, it doesn't mean that we meant he. It could be she also or any other things that go along with it. We're just covering all of that. Governing law, it's the state of Michigan. Electronic storage documents and records. Um, they, uh, they're acknowledging that that's how we're going to hold the documents. And with that... We're at the last page. Paragraph 44. In regards to the concern of agency, here's what we know. We are a designated agency company. Therefore, you watching this have been designated to represent a buyer. You have been represented by the broker to represent a seller. And we know that the only way that you would ever become a dual agent is if you directly, working with a buyer whom you represent, working for a seller whom you represent, you bring those together in the same transaction, you would be a dual agent. Paragraph 44 is solely for the purpose of addressing our supervisory brokers. This might be one where you're going to need some additional understanding from your broker manager 
But here's the simple part. By our signatures below, the parties acknowledge that the selling broker and salesperson are designated agents of, if you are the buyer, great, you check that box. If this is an in-house transaction, now guys, this is recorded for all of our companies. It's Cobalt Banker Professionals. If you're Cobalt Banker Professionals and the house that you've sold is Cobalt Banker Professionals, you're checking off both boxes. If you're Cobalt Banker, well, no, excuse me, if you're Century 21, Town and Country, and you sell a Century 21 Town and Country listing, if you're in Rochester, and the listing agent is out of Clinton Township. You check both because the selling broker salespersons are designated agents of. It's in town and country. If it's SACMAR, both agents are in SACMAR. If it's AAA North and both are AAA North, you guys get the picture. That would be Yes and yes, and at that point, is solely transaction of. And you notice that it just says XXX because that's where Century 21 would be. Coal Banker Professionals would be. And as such, and this is the reason that this is key that you understand it, it's making a disclosure to the buyers and the sellers that the supervisory brokers the broker managers of those offices or office is a supervisory broker and acting as a dual agent. It's the redisclosure that is required by law. That doesn't change the need for you when you are a dual, dual agent. And by the way, if it was, you had both sides, you were a dual agent, you're still checking buyer, you are still checking seller, you are still checking is. Because this addresses the, again, supervisory brokers. You'll have to, in a case where you are now a dual agent because you have buyer and seller in the same transaction, you need to redisclose. Paragraph 45, guys, we're just about done. 45 is your catch-all. If there's things that haven't been addressed in the rest of the purchase agreement, Paragraph 45 allows you to put the terms and conditions in there. Now, don't get too creative and write things on your own. We have clause libraries. When you have to start getting creative, you need to go to the clause library. Otherwise, keep it simple, salesperson. The last part says that this offer will expire on, here's your date, at... AM or PM upon the seller's receipt or upon the seller's receipt of revocation. So the buyer can pull this at any time. It's not up until that they have and then it's dead. The buyer could pull the offer at any time prior to receiving notice of acceptance. But every agreement has to have a, I'll call it kill date. It's only valid until. It's no longer valid if the response is not delivered back prior to this time. Now, buyer acknowledgement, buyer is signing, now formally making their offer. Do I need to witness this? The answer is no. It's not required. See, when we got into digital signatures, I can send it off. Elisa's sitting here with me. I could send it off to her to the email addresses that she and her husband have told me. And do I know that it was her husband that signed and then she signed? Do I know that? Did I witness that? The answer is no. So it would be a mistake for us to put our name on there. What we do know is we sent them to each of their individual addresses. But if they share emails and she can get into his, he can get into hers, do we know who signed it? 
but they are binding when that happens. Now, we've got a completed purchase agreement at that point, and on the other side, the seller's agents receive this. They review the entire document with the seller, and the seller has, guys, two options. They can accept it or they can reject it. The seller has two options. They can accept it, they can reject it. Well, yeah, but Darwin, you got three boxes. Couldn't we just have the seller counter offer? Yes. But by counter offering, what did they do? They've rejected. So they have to reject to be able to make a counter offer. Should they accept, they check the box, seller signs. Should they reject, flat out, do nothing else, about all they're going to do, if they do anything, is check seller rejects, and I would not sign it if I had received this. So keep that in mind. I don't want to have any misinterpretation to my signature representing a seller. But I'd check it off, and at most I'd have them initial it. Okay? So keep that one in mind. But if there is a counter offer, I want my seller to check it. The seller can then clarify what their counter offer would be. And now we have a new offer. It's really an offer. At first we had the buyer offering to the seller. Now we got the seller making an offer to the buyer. Seller's making this valid until. So just like the buyer did, this is the same pertinence. And then seller would sign. Now it goes back to the buyer. Buyer has an option. You can say yes. You can say no. If you say yes, you sign it. And then it gets delivered back to the seller. So guys, what I would tell you, if it's not an acceptance at this point of the counter offer, and you make an offer back, write a new purchase agreement. Write a new purchase agreement. No, just keep it simple. Write a new purchase agreement. If you can't say yes at this point to this offer, write a new purchase agreement. And with that, guys, that wraps up your introduction to the purchase agreement for all HRC companies. You got questions? Check with your broker manager. Walk through these documents with them, and they'll take care of it. So, guys, we'll see you on more paperwork and more forms. Have a great one.